The BHP Podcast is presented by bowhunterplanet.com. Join the hunt. The BHP Podcast is proudly presented by Cold Steel Knives, HHA Sports, Reveal Cellular Cameras by Tacticam, Element Outdoors, Skull Hooker, Scott Archery, and Burris Optics. Hey everyone, this is Tim for Bowhunter Planet. Make sure you check out the new podcast, Respect the Game, wherever you find your podcast. Hey guys, welcome to Boner Plant Podcast. Dave Thomas here with Kevin Conlon and Jamie Noteboom. And today um, we have from the Bone Collector, Michael Waddell. Mike, how are you, man? Doing good, brother. How y'all, man? Doing great. I was telling you earlier that hat's sweet, man. Nice job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I apologize, Dave. We've been uh, we've been pinging each other via text for a long time trying to trying to get back on the podcast. So man, I'm glad we finally hooked up. And yeah. And I sh- and I wish I wish I would have done this at least a week ago or a month ago. Then I wouldn't have to talk about the deer I missed just yesterday in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so tell us about some of your adventures. So I guess take us real quick through, you know, uh, I guess from the beginning of the year. Like, what's been going on with you with this whole COVID thing? Like, what what, have, what has changed for you, I guess, from January till right now? Or, you know, how, what have you seen, I guess? Well, just like you guys and, and really everybody across the country or world I should say it's, it's been mayhem for the most part well, I say mayhem and in, in slowing down I guess would be the mayhem and just watching all the madness and uh I know you guys been talking a lot about it on the podcast but the same with me obviously you can see I I came in anybody watching via zoom or video I'm, I'm filthy I'm dirty I, I got home and just got out here on the farm actually our September bow season comes into Georgia so we've been filling feeders we're a state that you can legally feed and actually, we've been me and my dad have been plowing, uh, getting some pl- food plots ready. So I quickly uh, just took my little three-year-old boy and started working real hard. And and I told my wife, you know, since she'd been the last week and a half with him when I've been gone, I said, look, I'll take the, I'll take him. We'll eat ice cream. Well, I didn't tell her we were going to plant food plots. So I've been having my three-year-old help me load up corn sacks <laughs> and all kind of stuff. But it, it's been it's been good and bad. The the the, the bad is obvious. Um, missed a lot of appearances when i say appearances a lot of the consumer shows it was going to go down this spring um i was actually in minneapolis in march and the governor come and shut that show down and told us to go home wow. basically and i haven't traveled at all i did go to wisconsin in july they had a big event up there larry polterback had a big event up there called bow fest so i was able to go up there and shoot our bow and see a lot of people but just been at home man i, I farming uh, thank God I had a lot of deer meat in the freezer. And yeah. just now you got to where you can finally go get some chicken breast and some ribeyes at the store and toilet paper. But uh, our governor also is really conservative from the fact that he pretty much basically said he didn't call completely BS on the COVID. He just said, look, we're going to keep open. So in Georgia, you don't have to mandatory wear a mask anywhere. Like he made it an executive order. So he was one of the few governors here in Georgia that basically said, look, okay, you know, I know this is uh, some pretty tough stuff, but we're going to go back to life as usual. So that's pretty much what's been happening in Georgia. But anywhere else you go, go through the airports. I've been flying. I've, been, I've flown twice in the last couple of weeks, and it's just crazy in airports. Everybody's wearing masks. And this is a time, if you're an ugly dude and you're unmarried and you got pretty <laughs> eyes and a silver tongue, this is your chance, baby. <laughs> you know, I was going to tell you. About it. I was going to tell you, my, uh, my sister-in-law, she comes over one day and she's like, Hey, I got you guys some peaches. And we're like, Oh, cool. She's like, yeah, they're fresh from Georgia. I'm like, what do you mean? She said, Oh, you order them online. As this truck drives all the way up from Georgia to Michigan with fresh Georgia peaches. And they were amazing. No I come Dude, with it. Like, we what? don't have now, now when you eat you about a four or five of those peaches fresh from Georgia, cause you can't stop at one. They're like candy. Oh my um, gosh. Go ahead the next day, plan on locking your bathroom door because you're going to be in there for a little while. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Georgia, you know, we are the peach state. And uh, peanuts or goobers, as they call them down here, and peaches, man, we grow them. And, and even me, man, I grew up eating. I mean, when it starts coming July, I'm telling you, man, you start getting those fresh Georgia peaches, and it's so good. We make ice cream, and we just it's eat them, put some in the cooler. And, I mean, like, literally every kid around is just walking around. Mm. You know, the kids around here eating peaches like kids are drinking beer in Germany. <laughs> They're good on the Blackstone, too. <laughs> yes. Oh, interesting. You can grill them? Yeah. yeah. And they grill some. Wow. Interesting. I, uh, I'll, I'll never forget that. And it must be that way for you guys. But I was in Florida one time visiting my sister, and I was walking down the street. And I just remember this orange hanging 
like in the in the walkway and i was like i was with my buddy i was like 19 i'm like i'm taking that orange you know so i grab it we start eating it and i'm like this is the best orange i've ever had in my life <laughs> i was just now i was thinking about the peaches i was like man you got that's like amazing you just like walk out grab a fresh peach i mean we're kind of the same way with apples uh michigan's got a lot of apples and cherries but uh, you know, we have to go to like big apple orchards to get them, but there's there's some pretty impressive apple orchards in this region that are really nice. If you ever come out here in the fall, that's where you need to go. <laughs> I, w- I would love that, and I I know what you mean. It, it is cool, man. That's one cool thing about traveling around the country. You'll find different areas areas that just I, I guess it's the soil that is just unbelievable. Certain things like you get south of here down to Vidalia, Georgia. The onions are unbelievable, and you would think you'd plant that same onion, you know, yeah. like where you're from. It'll grow, but it just don't have the same taste. And That's same with, same with apples there with you guys. You can we can yeah. plant the same apple trees, we can grow them, but they just yeah. not as sweet. And so it's, it's I've always thought that was kind of cool, which makes me all, it makes me help understand better why sometimes you go to Midwest and we got those big old bucks like in Illinois and Iowa and Kansas. It's, it's got to be the soil, man. I know genetics and everything, but <laughs> something's in there. <laughs> something's in the soil, man. It's got to be. Yeah, it's so funny. Ever go out west and have huckleberries? Ooh. I have had huckleberry jam like uh, yeah. that, that yeah. I've had some outfitters have, and, and I've never had the huckleberries, but I've had it jam. Yeah, I really good. A, I went to a farmer's market out west, and they were selling actual huckleberries. And, uh, wow. Cool. That's awesome. What good. state were you in for that? That was when we were in uh, Montana. Wow. Very cool. Well, remember in Hawaii, Hawaii, we were in Kona and the coffee. Oh, my God. Good, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Kevin Kevin got talked into the big $200 package. (laughs) Ship to your door. (laughs) I get get talked into everything. (laughs) It was hilarious. You should see my mother-in-law. It was the you buy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, goodness. It's, it's uh, so, always funny, too. You think about, like, Cuba and Dominican always have those best mm, tobacco leaves. That's yeah. where everybody wants a good cigar. And, and so, yeah, I guess, I guess you, that, that, that'd be a good little uh, traveling show is just to show where all the best delicacies yeah. and vegetables and fruits and onions and to find cigars. And, of course, you get in Kentucky, they, they seem to grow a lot of moonshine up there, too. <laughs> and uh, bluegrass. <laughs> I don't know if that comes from the soil. Maybe they, maybe they just – I that's think hilarious. that's more of a homemade deal. <laughs> So tell us, when you get into deer season uh, specifically, uh, what is your go-to like in your mind? Are you, are you always starting off like, like for instance, for me, I am going, my goal right now is to go sit October 1st, which is opener for Michigan, shoot a doe or a buck uh, because I want the meat as well. So, I mean, what is your position on that? Do you, like when you're shooting at home and all that, are you see a big doe, you just pop it or do you wait and you're still just hunting a big buck for a little while? I, I've got certain stands. I definitely go in for whack a doe. Like, um, and now you know it's made a little easier because the trail cameras kind of tell you so much what's going on. And then I have five boys, or I'm sorry, four boys and one little girl. And all of my kids, except Waylon, who's just turned four, they like to bow hunt. And so obviously, even though we got some nice, you know, if you want to call them target bucks, you know, they're kind of specific. We know what stand. Like, if you come down tomorrow and hunt in Georgia, I'd say, look, Dave, there's Man, there's a big mature 10-pointer dude. He's here every three nights. You might want to hold out. There is a bunch of does coming in. But then I'll have a few stands that, man, they'll just be tons of smaller bucks and riddled with does. So a lot of times what I'll do, same like you're saying, is uh, if we're running low on meat or if I've had a come off a miss like I just did in Utah, I just want to go to that stand that evening and I just want to torch something for my confidence if I yeah. haven't, if I haven't yet had that opportunity, because I, I really believe the mechanics of shooting even a big old doe, well, obviously they certainly the same. And for me, anytime I tell myself that this is the deer I want to shoot, I start getting that heartbeat. Like I can decide that <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know if you guys have this happen, but there'll be a doe come in, let's just say, and you're like, oh no, I was, I'm gonna wait on that big eight I got pictures of, and then it starts getting closer to dark, and that doe's feeding around in a plot or, you know, whether you can legally put out some bait or corn, then all of a sudden you're like, I think I'm going to shoot it. And immediately you've been watching it for 20 minutes and your heart just starts beating. I do that still to this day. And all of a sudden I'm shook and nervous. So I definitely yeah. think it's, it's about, I think that's the mechanics that make it good. And so, yeah, I, I will shoot a, I will shoot a doe sometimes early season, early on in a hunt, just to kind of break the edge and kind of, you know, get to scratch the surface almost like a, you know, just, just go ahead and knock one out just so I have that confidence again. Yeah. It's so funny you said that because you're absolutely right, though. As soon as yeah. you decide in your mind, 
I'm going to, I'm going to actually shoot this thing. All of a sudden everything goes out the window. And I, I will oh, yeah. say this, I will say this when I, when this happens to me, it depends what I'm using though. And it changes my philosophy on that feeling for me, everybody's different, but if I'm shooting a crossbow, I don't really get that feeling. But if I'm shooting yeah. my compound, I get it like crazy. Like it's just anxiety. Just like, Oh my God, don't mess yep. this up. Don't mess this up. You know? And it's just, there's, there's so many more mechanical things happening in a compound, you know, cause you're gotta do the set. You gotta get the anchor. You got to put it on there. You got to squeeze and not slap it. I mean, there's things happening in your mind that you got to. So I think it's really important to, if, if you're going to get a doe anyway, it's extremely important to shoot one if you can as soon as possible. I mean, I think it'll help you uh, towards your mechanics towards, you know, when you do pull it up against a nice 10 point or something nice and you're like, oh man. Yeah. Oh, so, everything you said, I agree. I 100% uh, agree with I want to hear the story about the one that got away because if you can miss, I, I feel better about myself. <laughs> man it, it I, I was dude uh, i was so shocked because i mean and it's funny i know that sounds pretty arrogant I, I swear it does but i when i when i first started having an opportunity to hunt on camera i was a cocky little old 18 year old 19 working at real tree and i didn't get a chance to hunt much and obviously i was really young i was helping guide turkey hunters for bill jordan working at real tree and i remember going to video a lot and we videoed with a lot of celebrities and um what I mean by celebrities, I'm not talking about hunting celebrities or personalities. I'm talking about the, the Mark Chestnuts, uh, actors, actresses. We had the show on TNN. Well, a lot of times, I mean, I'll just be blunt, they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn. And I would get so <laughs> aggravated. You know, I'd, I'd hunt with these guys, some of them, especially with a bow and arrow. And I was like, my goodness, man. I would, you know, and, and I hadn't had a chance to hunt these areas with a bow or a gun. I was just videoing. And I, I remember telling Bill Jordan one night, I was like, dude, we got to get some people who can shoot. These celebrities are cool, but man, we need to put these deer in the back of the truck. And so <laughs> Bill and David at that time, they were hunting a lot and they, they were pretty consistent, but um, some of our celebrity guests were just, man, they were kind of aggravating me. So I made the comment, Bill said, well, it ain't as easy as you think on camera. And I said, I can tell you one damn thing. I'm going to smoke them if they come in front of me. Right. You know, so Bill, <laughs> I'm not lying. Dave. So a couple, uh, it was like later no. that year in January, him and David Blanton gave me a chance to hunt the Encinitas Ranch. And so, the first deer, I, I, I went down there and I had a, a buddy of mine that was going to video me. And, and, you know, you can have the spin feeders and the whole nine yard in Texas. We, and so I was fired up. I was like a, like a banshee. We didn't even have trail cameras. I was just running around everywhere looking for deer sign and all the feeders were torn up. And so we moved this little tripod in. And this deer, there was a, there was a feeder about 100 yards from us. And this deer, there was just trails coming through. And very rarely do you do this. But uh, I, I just set up a tripod in this mesquite tree. I look up, here's a 150 inch solid deer coming right at us. It walks up six yards and sends some brush. And um, I pull back and I'm already pulled back. Well, I got to looking and my heart was pounding. And man, at six steps, this deer is barely in the clear. And I shoot and blow hair off the bottom. I missed him. And dude, I, it was like a death in my family. I, I, and so I, I was like, and, and so I, I was like, oh man, my oh Lord, I was. I was crying. The aftershot. I was just sitting there looking like, how did I miss this deer? And so, uh, of course, I had to eat crow call Bill Jordan and David Blanton. <laughs> and, and I never forget David Blanton said, hey, that don't worry. And at the time, at the time, guys, you know, we talk about hunting shows. At the time, this, our shows on Realtree Outdoors were following NASCAR races. Y'all remember those yeah, days? Yeah, that was Sunday. big time time. Yeah. So, so the first time you ever saw Michael Waddell deer hunt was about <laughs> three, three million people. <laughs> Three million people um, that was <laughs> that was sitting there. Th Three million people sitting there watching this show, and oh I missed it deer six yards. And, and and all my friends from all uh, you know, they like, what do you suck? And so you had your I, chance. I, I, yeah, and I and I told myself literally like this was a this was a deal. I said, look, I'm I'm gonna better myself, and I'm gonna be on my game. And so I took that serious because I'd embarrassed myself so bad. And so after that, I started getting a chance. And I started shooting deer, and I made a couple long shots, 50-yard shots, even a couple 60-yard shots on camera. And so I was like I, – I went from, at the time, a hero I thought about myself as a bow hunter to a zero. And so I had to build my confidence back up. And so here lately I've been doing really good. I hadn't missed a deer in a long time. And so I just missed one like last night in Utah. As we was going to try to do this podcast earlier, and I couldn't – I didn't, couldn't get service out there, and the mountain's good. And so, yeah, I had one – 44 yards 
and just dead rights. It wasn't a giant deer, but it was a nice mature mule deer buck. And I pulled back and put it right on him. I had a chance to put my uh, range finder on him, got him range 44 yards exactly. Matter of fact, I ranged him so many times, it was like 44, 45, 44, <laughs> 45. I mean, I, you know, I burned him up, right? And I shot and shot probably three foot to the right. I don't know what I did. I don't know if I can in my bow. But, yeah, it, you'll see it on Bone Collector. I just clean whipped, and Nick Mutton was there, and everybody was laughing and having a good time. So I'm actually now excited to share it, with, you know, to, for, with everybody because you're right. I, I, once again, I've gotten pretty cocky and arrogant, like, man, I don't miss. And I freaking whipped. And I wish I was doing like an 80 yard, you know, I was going for broke. But no, I mean, you know how that is in well, Western looking, country. Well, you got to be able to do it. Were you looking at the equipment right away, saying that was something wrong with his bow? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like you, you ever been on the range or shooting a course and you make a bad shot and everybody's looking. <laughs> like, that couldn't have been me. I, I, I was looking everywhere. I, yeah, I don't yeah. know what had happened. So, One, uh, but yeah, I did miss. I, I, was, I was filming for one of the guys on our team, Brian, one time, and this buck came out on our left. It was about 30 yards out. And we had sat there a while. We were so excited. We're like, oh, my God, you got a chance, you know? So, like, I get the, I get the camera on, and I'm like, I'm ready, man. I am ready. I, yeah. see, that, I, see, he's draw, I see him at full draw in the corner of my eye, and this buck's just sitting there, like, just standing there, looking the other way. And all of a sudden, I hear the arrow. I hear him shoot, and I see in the camera, because I'm watching the, the screen, I see, I see this flash <clears throat> kind of go across the screen. I'm like, <laughs> what? And I see the deer just like turn look run turn <laughs> he shot and somehow if he's aiming like this way the arrow went like that way oh it was my so God. crazy like it went like 40 yards to the left i don't know he's like it's the broadhead <laughs> like, <what? laughs> that's so did you hit your cam on your leg oh feet yeah. off then the same guy same guy a different time this is my cousin by the way so it's funny but the, a different time uh, same thing i was filming him and i was I don't know, about 15 yards on a tree behind him. And this buck comes and it comes right under the stand and he goes to shoot it. And I, I'm filming the whole thing and all of a sudden fires and I see the deer do something weird. And then it like runs and runs into a tree and keeps running trees and like runs off. I'm like, <laughs> the heck happened? He freaking, the cam hit his leg and it hit the deer in the head. Oh my goodness. No joke. Arrow was sticking out of the side of the head. I didn't, I'm like, what is happening? You know, and it's just the deer was so messed up because, you know, and it died literally not far from there. But it was, it was crazy. Oh, my goodness. luck, though, because this year he shot one, right? And he's like, I, I crushed this deer. I crushed him. And I'm following <laughs> trail that, that Ray, you know, the blind dude could follow. Piled up about, what, 100 yards, maybe, Dave? Shot right in the ass. <laughs> no! Bleeding. <laughs> blood everywhere. That's right. That I forgot. <laughs> Good old Bauer. So, so my best friend, like all <laughs> from like kindergarten on, he's also my third cousin. His name is Jackson Bishop. We call him Boo. And he does all of our sales, all of our licensing, and he is full of crap as a Christmas goose. He's just one of those <laughs> southern talking. I mean, he a sell a dead gum anchor to a man that can't swim down by the river. That's this guy, you know. And so, so I said, Jackson, you'd be funny, dude. We need to get you on a couple of shows. I can tell you right now. <laughs> hell, I'd be, I'd be poison on him. You, I'd buy a folk ride, be scared. Of, you know, he just start talking all this crap, you know. So we sent him to Pennsylvania up there by y'all. And, um, and we was doing that neighborhood hunt, you know, where you could just shoot does and kind of that suburban stuff. And, uh, and I figured that'd be a good place for him because he could, you know, you don't really worry about having to worry about a deer being a five and a half year old deer. It's just hunting. And these people are just wanting to get these, Right out of Philadelphia, wanting to get these deer out of the neighborhood. First shot, he he pulls up there. We got our we got our producer uh, with him, and he shoots, turns to the camera, smoked him, baby, and it's a big old doe. Well, the producer turns the camera and says, "Boo, you you missed, man. You shot over. I'm telling you, I torched it. You better start looking." <laughs> and so we get to looking back, or the producer does at the time, and it looked like a clean miss. He's, "I'm telling you, I heard it hit me. You know, I smoked him." <laughs> So anyway, one of our friends from Pennsylvania who was there called Jackson. He said, dude, did y'all just shoot a deer? He said, I did. I thought I smoked him. He said, well, a deer just come running by here by me, which he was about 50 yards, 60 yards from him in this little tight little valley. He said, and it was bleeding out the mouth. And I'm like, what? And so he couldn't figure it out. And so sure enough, 
this deer that he smoked, kind of like y'all were just talking about, he had hit him right in the jugular vein. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he, my He God. pulled his shot high and way to the right and just sent it right through his neck. But the whole time, it had been a double lung. <laughs> and, and only because we had it on video, the producer's like, I'm telling you, shot over him to the right. But he ended up killing the deer. So that's wow. funny what you see. And that just shows how bow hunt, dude, how we get all jacked up. And sometimes with the ca if the camera ain't there, people really <laughs> do. You kind of visualize this perfect shot. I agree. In reality, yeah. it's it's not a perfect shot. Yeah. Yeah. Even that case, he thought he hit it in the shoulder. He's like, I hit it in the shoulder. I'm like, dude, there's an arrow sticking out of his head. <laughs> like, what <laughs> is going on? Right in the bread basket. It, it almost, uh. I mean, like on a serious note, it almost helps me realize how hunting accidents can happen because, you know, psychologically, mm -hmm. they've interviewed a lot of these people. They shot people and they say, man, I saw a 10 point buck. And like they from rubbing trees to, and it would be somebody yeah. like with an orange vest. So, so if you think about it, it's got to be that same <laughs> thought process. How do you, how does a double lung right above the heart, double lung tight in the shoulder turn into right into honky tonk, but donkey donk? That's a long <laughs> yeah. way from the double lung, but it does. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, man. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, Jamie over here. I remember uh, I have a video. I wish I wished to God I, I had a cue. I cute. knew this was coming up. I wish yeah, to God yeah. I had a cue. <laughs> This guy Jamie right. was on to change the subject, right? <laughs> this dude, he's at bear camp. Biggest bear walks in. He's got a, he stands up. This is two different hunts. So the first hunt, he has a compound. The camp, the GoPro's on. You see him stand up. He's just. I mean, literally, <laughs> everything was shaking his whole body. <laughs> looked like it looked like a John Taylor song or something, the electric, whatever that Mexico song. He's like <laughs> 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 he doesn't get a shot. And the next day, he has a crossbow, shoots that bear behind him, no problem. That's what I was getting at about the crossbow compared to a compound. Like, he was just I believe like, that. Dude, so I, whatever, it is, whatever it is about having a bow and arrow in your hand, when, a, when a, especially the buck that you want, it, and um, you'll literally be shaking like R. Kelly at the Children's <laughs> Choice Awards. I mean, I, I'm, I don't care who you are. And, and what's funny is, dude, have you ever noticed, though, with that bow, when you break it back, like – when you when you break it back and something about that pressure and muscle, then you start calming down. Mm -hmm. But before yeah. that, dude, it could be out of control. And you're exactly right. With a gun, with a gun uh, or a compound, I I don't. I'm the same way. I, I'm not that nervous prior. And now on a big buck with a gun or crossbow, I still got that. Mm. Yeah, there's you know, it's, it's got a little jitter in my sh scope, but uh, <clears throat> but you know, I, I, that, you know, it is cool. I'm glad we're talking about this because, man, I've been blessed to hunt a lot since you know I was talking about 18, 19 years of old working at Real Tree and getting a chance to hunt a little bit with those guys, and now I'm 47, <laughs> so I've had a just an unbelievable blessed to hunt, you know, and shoot a lot of animals with a bow and arrow as well as you know with a gun, a muzzleloader, crossbow. And, dude, I'm telling you, I st people ask me, do you get tired of it? you still get nervous? Man, I do. I, every deer, I still, I still have to go through my checklist. And I will say the mechanics of it, because there's been a lot of experience with shooting animals, it, and I'm like you guys have shot a lot of animals too, you know, the mechanics of it, it does come back to you, kind of like riding a bike or jumping a little, you know, jumping a little jump like we all did on a BMX bike. But I still have to think hard. I still have to think about aiming. And I still get just really nervous, and an anxiety gets over me. And I, and I really, I think that's part of the that emotion that keeps us coming back for more mm -hmm. because we can't completely control it, but we're always fighting to control it. But when we do control it and deliver a good shot, that victory and whatever we say when that camera pans back, it, it's just it's like scoring a touchdown. So sometimes it's almost in tears. Sometimes you're literally. Mm -hmm cocky and saying something that makes no sense singing some van halen song that you hadn't thought about since 1982 <laughs> i don't know what it is but it's like a victory but it's a victory within yourself so it's not yeah. something you're trying to impress others with it's just you won the battle that you tricked this deer and then you finished it with a good era I, it's a i mean it's a i know it sounds morbid but it's like a sexual experience when it all comes together <laughs> at the end and i still get nervous man i still get nervous you know, it's interesting. I was watching the show on Netflix. It's called um, High Score, and it's about video games, like how they started, like Atari and Nintendo. It's really interesting. I watched it yesterday, but they, they brought up this thing uh, that they there's this scientist, psychologist, psychologist guy came up with, and he called it the wave. And really what it, what it actually is is when your mind is so, like, caught up in something that time doesn't matter. And it just goes by without any thought of time. And what we would then what they called it was you're in the zone. And it made yeah. sense to me 
Cause like in hunting, you know, sometimes you're sitting there and you see this buck, everything at that point, nothing really matters because you're focused on, is he coming in? Is he skirting me? Is he coming around? <clears throat> so, but I thought that was interesting that you can, it, it kind of applies to anything, you know, the, being in the zone, I guess, basketball, football, it doesn't necessarily matter, but I don't know, it was just kind of cool. And I was like, wow, yeah. if you really put that together and the psychological part of when you're hunting is like, you're just really in it, you know, and you, and you're trying to get it done type thing, you know? And I think that's what the non-hunting public don't understand. And, and I know in a way they still going to think that we're kind of, you know, weird to have that emotion when we hunt or take an animal. And, and, it, and I understand, like, if I think really deep, I mean, it, it's, it might be different for some, but for, for me, there is an emotional process that you go through that is, it, it is kind of a high. It is you're in that zone, that excitement, because you have worked so hard. You, you do, sure, we, in that essence, we are trophy hunting. We want that deer. But even when you just put meat on the table, there's something about being in the wild, uh, especially like we were out here in just the Western country. We'd work so hard, walk, walking seven, eight miles a day, and that's one thing I wasn't ready for with this COVID because I've been eating a few extra like Georgia peaches and, and biscuits. <laughs> so uh, I, I was at 10,000 feet all. just begging for air. Yeah, so I was, I was out of shape. And so by the time you get that opportunity, man, there's just a lot of emotion. And so uh, I, 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 I don't know exactly what it is, but that mental part of it is definitely what keeps us coming back for more because it is like that, that football, that sports feeling. But at the end of it, we, we are really – and that's what's confusing to the non-public hunters. We do love this animal. I mean, it's, it's something that we've worked so hard to feed, to take care of our land, take care of our resources. Yeah. You know, the desire to hunt them is what made us a conservation. I got in an argument the other day with, with a big conservation organization because they was talking about conservation comes before hunting. And I said, bull crap. I said, you would, conservation is so boring. If it wasn't for us hunters, you would have no conservation. Us guys, I said, yeah. you go to Michigan, you go to Pennsylvania, you come to Georgia, Alabama, you go to Texas. If our desire wasn't there to hunt them, then we would not want to conserve them. I mean, look, look at yeah. a coon and possum. I don't, I ain't worried. I, I could shoot them all. And yeah. legally I can in Georgia because I love turkeys enough that I'm a conservationist because I want to hunt this turkey. Therefore I do everything to manage for numbers for them. So I really believe that hunting is what makes us love them more and conserve them more. So uh, you know, it, it just blows a lot of people's minds. So I get it. But all I can say, if there's anybody out there listening that is a non-hunter or agnostic to it, that don't even know it exists, that you run across this podcast. I mean, these guys here, um, you know, they, we, we all grew up hunting. You guys from up north, me down south, but we all share that together. And we are completely brothers in that. And that's another thing people don't understand. You can go from any accent to any culture, black, white, fat, skinny, broke, rich. When you're in hunting camp, it is 100% the same, man. It's like a chemistry and a, and a love and a respect for each other. And, and because we experience the same thing, we know each other. And so uh, that's why I always love to see more people get involved because the acceptance, once you step into that family of hunters and outdoorsmen and conservation, it's insane. And we pick on each other, obviously, and have a good time. And so I got rode hard last night. You know, all of us here that's missed, we get picked on. And, we'll, and, 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 and don't think your friend will ever for, – you will forget a hunting story, but if you screw up, they'll never forget it. So. Yeah. I think it, it's funny you say that because it does it's go deeper. I've this podcast and haven't missed. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that's we've true. We've all missed. I would say it's funny you said that because it does go a lot deeper. It doesn't – when you say it doesn't matter who you are, that's such a true statement because, like, I saw a video once of a friend who sent me a clip of this video. He was at a hunt camp with Luke Bryan, and Luke Bryan yeah. pulled up. And he's like, let's party. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. two fifths of Grey Goose. And he goes into yeah. hunt camp. And in hunt camp, he can be himself. You know, he doesn't have to yeah. be this huge celebrity. And he doesn't have to, he can actually just hang out with guys and no one cares. Yeah, you're going to talk about some stuff about his work, right? I mean, it's just, that's normal. People are curious. But after that, it's like, dude, Luke missed that buck. You know, I mean, it goes back to the, the hunt. You he's know? got yeah. the best reaction to shooting a big buck I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Luke, Luke, Luke loves it, man. And like a lot of those guys, that, but you're exactly right, hunting camp, you can let it all hang out. Um, yeah. We're going, of all things, man, I'm, I'm still real good buddies with Blake Shelton, and he texts and calls the other day. And uh, Tom McMillan, who's got a show on Sportsman, uh, Tom and Blake have always been good friends. I've always been friends with Blake. I actually met Tom through Blake, and um, he's like, Blake's like, man, I got about three days, dude. He said, I want to go do something fun and just – drink a few beers and just hang out and BS and not worry about cameras in Hollywood. 
Yeah. And I said, well, what do you, what do you want to do? And he told Tom McMillan, he said, dude, I want to go hunt. I want to go hunt some javelinas. And so anyway, we're going down to Texas. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know if we bring a camera and and yeah. uh, and you're right, Blake. Blake would just have a blast just for two or three days, literally just chilling out and going to uh, chase some javelina and uh, and just tell stories and 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 even if there's some a couple people that he don't know, as long as they're not there getting ready to Snapchat or whatever, you're gonna see a side to Blake. You can hear some jokes that you won't hear anywhere else. You're not gonna hear him <laughs> when he's behind the stage at the Boys. And so you're right, Luke is that same way, and everybody is because everybody becomes one yeah. and you're rooting and cutting up and you always got a couple of characters in camp that you can laugh at. Some dude can always grill the backstrap a little better and make the best chili. Some dudes always got the, uh -huh. the coldest beer and a bunch of it that, that we're raiding their cooler. And so, I don't know, it, it's so <laughs> special and it's so sad yeah. that people don't get to see it like we do and haven't enjoyed it. And I know a lot of the listeners is probably getting them excited just to think about because hunting camp is getting ready to start going up and, you know, we're all thinking about it, north, south, east, and west. We're all getting ready to kind of go clean out the, the camps and, you know, get the food plots ready. And obviously, we're getting the trail cameras out, getting an inventory. And so that, that's just – it's sad for those who don't know that feeling. It is like Christmas, and it still is to me, and I think it'll be that way until the day I die. And uh, it's, it's been a blessing for sure. How much, uh, how much land is Blake hunting on at home? Like 10,000 acres? <laughs> he, he, he is uh, – <laughs> he's just like the rest of us that if we did run into money what yeah we i in, agree he he's he built a lake up there that i'm telling you That's it looks cool. like lake it looks like lake superior in oklahoma it's it's freaking huge <laughs> and i mean you, you know that you can water ski on it wake more ride that's skis. cool but i want to say he has uh bought he's got several thousand i want to say four or five thousand acres is that, that how do bought. you how do you hunt that kind of acreage you know is that like crazy like when if you go there and hang out with them and hunt like how does i mean how do you even know where to go is it already kind of pre-done i mean yeah blake blake's um stepdad his name is a uh, uh, shack they call him shack and he's just a great guy he, he's kind of blake's land manager mm -hmm. it's oklahoma so you obviously you can legally you know it's feed spinner uh spin feeders and stuff so he's got feeders all over it but uh but to be honest blake, blake is not one of those real picky guys either so if you get to hunt his place He's not going to be that guy who says, hey, man, don't shoot this three-and-a-half-year-old deer. Uh, don't shoot this. He's got a lot yeah. of big deer in that country. It's around Tishomingo, and he's got a lot of big deer. It's full of hogs, full of turkeys. But um, mainly he just got cameras on feed stations, and he's got a bunch of big food plots. It's a really pretty area where you got a lot of kind of a Texas vibe, but you also got some big timber and some big oak trees and cedar trees and stuff. So it's really unique and really, really beautiful. And oddly enough, Gwen – you know, he's dating Gwen Stefani. Gwen loves it up there. She don't hunt. Wow. Uh, I've only met her one time, and I talked to her just a little bit about hunting, and she says, man, I don't really even understand it, but I know Blake loves it, and if Blake loves it, I support him. So she's just really cool, hip, kind of like you would think, hipster, open-minded yeah. kind of a chick. And um, But her sons, who are, you know, who are from another marriage, they love Blake like a dad. And that's uh, – I forget, is it Ragsdale, Gavin Ragsdale, the guy with Bush, she, she was married? Yeah, to I was going to say, I think it's the guy you know, from Bush. Glitter ring. But... Yeah, the yeah, same from Bush. Yeah, so <laughs> so he's straight city boy. I mean, straight up, you know, like paint your toenails and fingernails yeah, kind of yeah, dude. Yeah. And her kids grew up in that L.A. I'm talking mm. about her kids yeah, went I, to I get pedicures and manicures, you know, where. And so now yeah. that Blake has become like almost like a dad, they would rather get out there and ride four wheelers, hunt, That's chase cool. hogs and traps. So once again, they are obsessed with it. That's all they want to do is watch hunting yeah. shows. They they could be listening to this podcast. They're obsessed <laughs> with hunting now because of <laughs> because of Blake and that's Gwen Stefani's son and and yeah, Gavin's crazy. sons from Bush. So I mean, we, we yeah. never thought that, but that just shows you the power. You can get introduced to it. That it's it's awesome. Yeah, that's me. Hey, Mike, let's talk about real quick. I want to talk about your website. You guys got some really cool stuff on here, and I, I didn't. Uh, I just want to share it here on the, let me know you guys can see it. You guys see it? Yep. Oh, sweet. Oh, cool. So is this something, when did you guys start doing these cool plaids? It's awesome. We we started this last fall and uh, there's a company we've been really glad, uh, been really tickled to, to partner up with them and they have been making some really high end stuff. A lot of this does come from my wife who, uh, I mean, let's face it, all the main characters behind Bone Collector, we're hardcore rednecks and 
we're not fashion. I mean, we, you know, we, we, we got a, we had a cool logo and we try to keep an entertaining TV show. And outside of that, we just like to hang out and meet, meet with people. So my wife took a big part of this and really just said, Hey man, let's, uh, let's develop some cool stuff that when people do come to check out bonecollector.com that we have some really nice lifestyle, you know, flannel shirts, some really cool stuff. And, um, so, so we, we tried to up our game in that, lifestyle wear so to speak so yeah man thanks for bringing that up and putting it up there and we got yeah, some really good great. deals that all that is all sold direct uh just on bonecollector.com everybody knows that dot com and so nice you could come and just click click of a mouth have it at your doorsteps in two or three days we ship everything right out of our warehouse here in georgia so so it's all hands-on and uh and we are also very open to being critiqued if somebody gets something they don't like it we got a full-time customer service that will make it good if it's something you don't like or, you know, some quality. So we, we're real proud of that. Um, a lot of our stuff is made in America. We're trying to make more of it in America. So I can't say all of it is. We still got some, uh, still got some stuff that comes from overseas. But overall, man, we're just trying to do a better job of deliver some cool stuff. My wife even just started a, uh, a toddler line. And I know a lot of you guys have kids, too. We, I just couldn't find anything cool for my three-year-old and four-year-old to wear. Even up to 10 years old, I was struggling. And so my wife come up with a kind of a real authentic line. It's called VC Rascals. And, um, and, and so now we got a full line of toddler clothing, little overalls and cool little kids hats cool. and stuff. Because you know how our, our wives are. If, if we're going to go to the hunting club, well, they want to look legit too. And so my wife kind of you can hunt out of this, but it's more of a stonewashed old real tree original camo pattern, and it fits well. It's got little shotgun shells for buttons. Uh, it's got the bone collector logos on it, and so it's it's doing really well too because they just nobody had any cool <laughs> stuff like that. So we're trying to cover all bases best we can. Very cool. What about let's talk about some of the products that you know have the bone collector logo with it, like Hoyt and stuff. Let's. What do you? I guess what are some of those products? Obviously, we got the Hoyt. Uh, that we, you and I were talking about earlier in black or camo, which looks sick. Yeah, that black is awesome, dude. Seriously. It really is. That, that midnight black, man. It, it's, um, yeah, we, we've been really lucky to work. You know, I, come, I, I worked at Realtree for years. So obviously there's a Realtree point. Um, and so obviously I learned a lot about licensing. I learned a lot about marketing uh, and branding. And so Bone Collector, even though we do manufacture some of our stuffs, like some of our soft line like the the hats and t-shirts we do manufacture some of that stuff and sell direct most of the stuff that we do is a license so we will work directly with a company in this case you know hoyt's been a partner we endorse all the hoyts we love those bows but through our partnership they were they introduced a bone collector version of that hoyt and um and so it's really cool it's, it's you know it's got black limbs it's a signature line of limbs with the bone clicker logo on it it's got all yeah, i'm trying on to get it. the inside right it's not like on the inside there or the yeah top. yeah it's kind of on the top limb and the underneath the limb but it's a really cool looking bow and uh and so basically it's like a bone collector package or or you know it comes you can still change it out put what colors you want but most of the time they do that bone clicker green you know on the uh limb limb pockets and, and the different stabilizers and stuff i put the green on the back so uh, we're real proud of that. We we work with a lot of different companies. We have like Groove Life rings. We have those silicone rings. We have a bone collector model of that. We oh, have cool. a, we have bow sights, bone collector bow sights. So we do a lot of stuff to where we'll get a chance to design um, and work with a company to design a particular site that we developed or that we basically endorse. And so we've been really proud of that. So uh, unlike a lot of people just think that, these products is just slap a bone collector logo on them. We actually have input on every single one of them. If it's got bone collector on it from a hat to, to a, a bow sight, to a, uh, to a, a ring, we truly do try to make something that's, that we feel is unique that we would like to use. And hopefully if we like to use it, you know, somebody else would like to use it. So, you know, in anything you do like that, you, you have your haters and well, I ain't going to buy it. What else is freaking jacking the price up and bone collector <laughs> trying to get rich. Like, I mean, obviously we, we're trying to make money. You got to make money. Creative. That's how the world it, works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we, we don't, we don't try to jack the price up. We try to keep it the same and we just try to have a, a value in it, whether it's a bone collector dog collar or a, you know, bone collector ring. And, and we've been blessed to have a lot of different companies. And we even just started this past year working with Mountain Dew. Uh, oh, cool. And uh, Pepsi, we did a deal. And so, uh, 
th those type projects I think are really cool. Not only is it a blessing to be associated with a big company, yeah. but what a cool cultural expression when you walk in and you'll see a Mountain Dew and you'll see a Bone Collector logo or you'll see That's me cool. standing there with a bow and arrow. So sometimes this industry gets really weird and they'll start hating any one of us. I mean, I'm sure you guys have had it. You guys have had a lot of success with your podcast. And so sometimes it's amazing. The more success you have, the more people start hating and they're pissed about it. And I think yeah. it's, Shows a lot of selfishness and greed and uh, jealousy. And yeah. unfortunately, it's sad because our industry, we need more Mountain Dews. We need more, uh, you know, Chevrolets. We need more yeah. banking companies to get behind us. We need somebody like D Dave. We need you in a C store. We need uh, Lee Lakoski or Tiffany Lakoski. You know, we need that. We need Jim. <laughs> we need Jim Shockey on Fox News talking about yeah. elephant hunting. And so, True so that. any any one of us in, in this hunting industry, and I can't say it enough, if any of us hit a level to where we're getting an opportunity to do bigger things, we should all celebrate it because it's only going to open more doors. But what I've noticed about the hunting industry, and it makes me so mad, and I've seen it with successful podcasts like you guys. I've seen it with TV shows. I've seen it with personalities, whether they're just shooting some big animals, you know, whether they're one of these athlete wilderness runners like a Cameron Haynes, or whether it's a beautiful girl that looks really good in camo, whatever, you'll have immediately the industry has try to start shutting them down. And they too will be podcast hosts. They too will be TV hosts. And I'm thinking, dude, yeah. if you can't shine your light strong enough to make it on your own, then just shut up trying to put somebody else down because you're yep. pissed off you're not them. Obviously, if your mama and your sister are the only one listening to your damn podcast, then probably <laughs> quit. If if if, yeah. if your great aunt in Montana is the only one that added Sportsman Channel to watch your hunting show, it ain't my fault that nobody's gravitating to it. Yep. But don't try to be mad at those who are successful. Don't start hating on Jim Shockey because – He's hunting a musk ox with a freaking stick yeah. and eat, eating, you know, caribou eyeballs to do it. I, man, celebrate it because Jim <laughs> Shockey is going to open the door for me. Jim Shockey yeah. is going to open the door for you. Uh, I can possibly, through Mountain Dew, open a door when they see how great us hunters are. I want them to be calling bow hunting. You, you guys and say, hey, man, yeah. uh, man, Let's through go. whatever, we understand y'all got a podcast. Look, we want to <laughs> do more in this industry because of the loyalty. So, Anyway, yeah. I didn't even mean for it to go down that road, but we got to figure out a way to celebrate each other better. And that's why, you yeah. know, I do listen to what y'all do and I freaking love it. I love the realness. I love so many podcasts this industry has. I love so many TV shows. Now there's some that suck. I mean, yeah. they just, you know, and I, cause it's full of ego, but I, I don't know. Like yeah. I said, I didn't even mean to get started on that, but we got to <laughs> celebrate everything we do. And, we uh, guys, and I, and I want to say that. We need more guys to bring that hunting camp spirit to the industry. You know, amen. You know. Amen. And like, amen. Cause like right now I'm telling you, all I think about is, man, I can tell you right now. And again, a lot of times, you know, the hunting industry, I'm talking about it, but if we were right, if y'all here in Georgia right now, if I was in Michigan, I can tell you what we'd be doing. We'd probably, probably be getting ready to build a little fire, even though it's a little warm, crack open a beer, start sharing trail cam photos and wondering <laughs> what we're going to get into and whether it's going to plant a food plot, we would have fun. And so in that there is no ego in that. And I don't think that hunting, if you're good at it, makes you a badass. It's just badass we get to hunt. Yeah. And I think the industry, not not me and you and these conversations, we don't forget it. But when we get in that industry, we get to the ATA, it's like we're walking around in this major sword fight. And I'm like, what yeah. are we doing, guys? <laughs> I mean, you wonder why nobody's getting into this. We're marketing all of yeah. the industry on the male ego, which is the most unattractive thing. That's why, dudes – the cool, good-looking guy sitting at the bar who's Mr. Cool who thinks he's vain and thinks he's hot, that's why the chubby guy dancing that's got a joke in his pocket gets the hot chick and you go home by yourself. <laughs> Same with the hunting industry. You market with fun. Market with smiles. Yeah. Market with the hunting camp. Market it with the last. Market, it, market how fun it is when you miss and your buddy cuts your shirt tail off. Or, or Dave who can make the best chili. Or Uncle Joe who makes the best deer sausage. Or you know, I, yeah. I don't know. And, and and again, and then when we kill big bucks, we're going to celebrate that too. So I don't understand it. And that's why I've always thought there was a common bond between the North and the South. For Christ's sakes, we, we fought a civil war. But when it comes to hunting, Northern, yeah. Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Alabama, when I tell you we blood brothers, it is exactly the same. It's about yeah. hunting camp. It's about good food. It's about ribbing and cutting up 
and, and you guys grew up like I did. If you weren't getting picked on, nobody liked you. I mean, that's what hunting camp was. You got put down, you cut up, and it's joking. And that spirit is so contagious. And it's not about who is the biggest and baddest. And sure, through that, we all have these achievements. We shoot a deer a long ways. Or maybe it's you, Dave, that's just grinded it out and finally put it together yeah. and killed this big 130-inch eight-pointer you've been chasing for two years. We celebrate that. And, and that achievement that, man, you celebrate the things you did right technically. But at the end of it, just simplify it and we have fun. That, to me, the industry has forgotten. And if we don't get back to having fun, and especially the way politics are going these days, I'm afraid we're really going to have to fight even harder to, yeah. to save it. I, that ain't um, fear mongering. I just believe that. I, 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 I would say that um, I've, the, the, topic of, the topic of this industry and in collaboration is the biggest miss. So collaboration yeah. to me is the biggest miss in this industry. I, I, I work in the real world and I understand all of us do. And I understand business like no other. And what I see that's a complete miss in the archer industry is collaboration. Companies Amen. are scared to work with other companies. Like for instance, if I'm Bowhunter Planet, some of the other uh, you know communities like myself don't even return my call. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, how can yeah. you not return my call as just a person? let alone doesn't mean we have to do business together or do some sort of collaboration, which to me would make the most sense. You bring two communities together and you try to you know, help each other in the same sense. And there's no cost to that. And so yeah. to me, collaboration, you know, I, I sat on a, a panel, I watched a, a media panel, you weren't on it, but there were some other people on it in the industry, uh, the ETA put it on. And, but the problem was that the panel didn't allow for people like me who weren't talking on the panel to, talk or ask questions because that was the one thing I wanted to say is like okay what do you guys you guys want to grow the industry but how are we collaborating to grow it you're talking about you doing this and you doing that yeah and it's great you know Michael Waddell can do his thing on bone collector and they're huge and yep. do all this stuff but if you're not spreading that with other like working with the bow hunter planet or real tree or all these other people you're not working together to gr grow the community and the bigger issue no. then is all of us, and not really me necessarily, because we have day jobs, but all of the people who make their living in this industry, this is what it's all about. If you don't, if yes. you don't get sales for bows, nobody's going to have anything. I mean, it, it, it'll just keep going like this. So I've said you, it to, you're, I've said it to are, tons of people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, listen. So glad you do. And please qu uh, keep screaming it because here, here is the disconnect. And now I've been working in this industry as a cameraman, producer, marketer, host, whatever, since I've been about 18, 19 years of age. So I'm like freaking Joe Biden when it comes to dang politics. I've been, you know, uh, obviously, so I get mad when this industry don't grow. It puts it on me. And that's yeah. why, obviously, I'm not voting for Joe Biden because I'm thinking, well, well, freaking the guy's been in there that long. What has he done to make a difference? And you're mad at Trump been in there four years and made changes. So not to get political, but it's a comparison to me. So I've been in this industry since – you know, do the math since I've been 18 or 19. And I would say I really hit my stride when I was in my mid twenties, because then I really had a chance to start editing and producing for real tree outdoors, monster bucks. I had a chance to have that respect with David Blanton and Bill Jordan, where I could give an opinion of entertainment that we should do the monster bucks and shoot the targets or whatever. So what happens though, growing up all these years in this place called booger bottom, booger bottom to me, sometimes people's like, Oh, that's just marketing. That's it. And this what else he really from this place called booger bottom. I am, but Booger Bottom always <laughs> reminds me of my roots, just like you guys. If all of a sudden you don't have to do your day jobs in this podcast or a TV show, whatever y'all doing, get so big to where you can make a living for your family, well, obviously that'd be a dream to you guys. But if you forget that grind of 40 hours a week coming home doing this show, 40 hours a week still getting to go maybe to a Saturday afternoon bow hunt because guess what? You got kids, you got a recital, you got a ball game, you got a wife who says, honey, oh my God, you, you just care more about deer. We're not had one romantic dinner. <laughs> so it might be on the coldest freaking toenail moon of the city yeah. that you got to go to the fine steakhouse and take your wife because obviously it costs a lot if you're going to lose her, you know, yeah. out of being the unromantic dude. You don't want to have to go buy a house and give this what could be your ex-wife. You got to take care of home. You got to take care of your kids. So now, Here's Waddell, Nick and T-Bone. Here's Mark Drury, Terry Drury. Here's the Lukoskis. Every day, Monday through Sunday, our job is to leave our families, in some cases, your husband and wife, and we get to hunt all, all day. So now we're sitting here saying, dude, I wouldn't shoot no four-and-a-half-year-old deer. Let that deer get another year. 
We're like, my God, y'all have worked your butts off all freaking week. So, yes, if we don't remember our roots or talk to those people who are getting into this and listen to them how they feel about baiting, listen to them how it feels about uh, a bag limit or a check-in or all these things, it shouldn't be me. I, I just I have to go back and remember what that was like, but it, but it stays with me. So that's why you'll never see me do a tweet on Tuesday morning like, dude, hunting suck, just can't catch a break. Because some joker is out there in Georgia putting tar on the roof, wishing he was in yeah. hunting camp, period. Yeah. And the industry gets in this weird freaking just circle of, well, here's what we need to do. And I'm like, it's so obvious, guys. You're forgetting yeah. the other 13 million hunters that are out there that are busting their butt. They got all this peer pressure to shoot the right buck. They got families. They're trying to keep the light bill on. They're trying to buy the new Hoyt bow. They're trying to buy the new freaking Matthews bow. It, they could buy a small farm in Kentucky for the same price. And then on top of that, they go shoot a 100-inch eight-pointer in their deer club, and some asshole comes up and is like, well, dude, still got milk on his lips. I can't believe you shot that. And so you went from a freaking hero of making a great shot with an $1,800 yeah. bow with a twenty with a $40 arrow yeah. uh, you know, that you just ruined that your wife don't even know. And you're all ready to miss your kid's recital because you got the deer and you call it, baby, I'm not going to make it. I got to get this deer on the, out of the woods. Uncle Joe's going to come help me drag it out. I'm sorry. She don't care that you got a deer. It's like, okay, good. I'm, I hope you had fun. I'm so you are. And then all of a sudden, yeah, glad you're done. You know, little Sarah, she don't, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so you're worrying about Brutus showing up and going to the recital to see your daughter with your <laughs> hot wife. In the meantime, you're dragging out this deer. It's all worth it. And then the dude at the cooler is like, dude, can't believe you shot that one. And, and, and let me tell you what's happening. I done figured it out. I figured out the riddle. So in the meantime, you tune in, Bone Collector, we're shooting 150-inch deer. You turn over there, and Lee Lukoski shoots 190-inch deer. But he, then he tells you, well, the real big one wasn't showing up, so we went ahead and settled for this 190. <laughs> Jury's over here letting it. And, and, and I'm saying this, these are all great people and good friends of mine. Good friends of mine. But, you know, Mark's over there is like, dude, yeah, I got this big six-year-old, but I might just see what he does at seven. You know, what? I don't know. <laughs> and, 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 and so all of a sudden, this is what happens to the guy in Michigan or Alabama or Georgia. You know what he does? He is so disheartened. He's pissed off his wife, disappointed his daughter, missed the recital. He had a moment of complete purity of that psychological warfare that goes on to yeah. keep everything together, to make a good shot at 40 yards. Smoked him. He realizes that this, you know, if it's a G5 dead meat broadhead, T-Bone talked him in the bind. He's like, dude, it was freaking worth it. It flew like a dart deer, didn't run 50 yards. <laughs> oh, my God, this Hoyt is so good. It was worth $1,800. All of a sudden, on the way home, his buddy's mad he shot a 100-inch deer that was two and a half years of age. His daughter's disappointed. Daddy missed the recital. His wife is pissed off because hunting means more to him than his family. You know what that dude does? He sells it all and buys a pontoon boat and says, we can all just hit that boat. <laughs> yeah. So Game people over. want to know what's wrong with the hunting industry. This is it. If it wasn't for guys like y'all celebrating and talking these hunting stories that fuels yeah. it, it's work, it's expense. And so we've got to, we've got to look at that. But I don't think the industry, the obvious is so far above their heads that yeah. their heads are in the clouds. And somebody's thinking, well, if I pick this rock up and run up the mountain, somebody will want to do it more. If I, if I, you know, if I talk about killing a bigger deer, somebody want to do it more. Everybody wants to be in shape. Everybody wants to kill a big deer. Keep it fun. Keep it simple and make it easy yeah. for the people. Don't make it so hard. So uh, y'all can see y'all hit on my hot button, man, because I think that's the biggest job. That's my job to sell hunting license. And on my watch, guys, we've saw hunting license decline. So guess yeah. what? I feel like I failed. I take that personal. And so uh, if the in, in the industry should take it personal. It's a lot going on, honestly. Like, I, I mean, first off, just to answer a question, I go back a few minutes. We talked about um, the people who are always downing, downing us and other people and all that in the industry. Well, the thing is, is they always forget about the grind, what it took to get to where you're at. Everybody forgets yeah. that part. They just think, they assume, like, I'll start a podcast and we'll be huge tomorrow. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be gaming. It could be uh, golf. It could be tennis. It could be any sport, any business. It doesn't matter. If you don't grind and you don't work for it and you don't want it, you'll never achieve it. And just because you might get zero views doesn't mean you shouldn't keep doing it if that's what you really keep want. Keep going. But yeah. if, you, if, you, if you really just want to be what someone else has, then you're wasting your time. So anyway, but, but what I was going to say real quick is that there's besides the industry having our own issues with, you know, like no collaborations and some, but not like general. And there's no like really 
top, you know, organization in the industry who's helping to collaborate companies or bringing it, you know, so that we are growing. The other issue we run into for lost sales of tags are things like uh, in Michigan, you know, we had a uh, we had a, a Democratic governor and a couple years back, so that we had CWD, she banned baiting at the end of her term. Ted Nugent comes to Michigan, talks to Rick Schneider after he is elected as a Republican governor. He lifts the ban on baiting, and baiting's good. We're good for eight years. The next governor comes in who's Democratic, closes baiting again. Now we're no baiting for eight years. And, and this whole time, there's like three, three or four billion dollars at stake for the state of Michigan as a whole. Yep. This is just Michigan. There's all these other states doing having issues like this. My point is, why are we being political? about something like shooting an animal like you know what i mean like what, yeah no what, what the hell uh, there's a lot of man, money I, here this is i mean and, and people yeah. are just not funny because i can't take a kid out put a corn pile out for a kid to shoot a doe i mean yeah what? come on like it's just that, that, that's wrong and, and, and baiting is a very controversial subject within the politics of hunting the ethics of hunting and let me tell you this i'm a hundred percent i think it should be a national lift on baiting you should be able to bait everywhere and here's why it don't make sense here's why and i will put i will throw myself under the bus for this one i have been blessed financially i have made a good living off hunters and fishermen buying my product now again like you say dave there was a grind for me to get there i'm telling you i went for 10 years i made eighteen thousand dollars a year as a camera guy Never had any intentions of being on a camera. Never had an idea or brainstorm of bone collector or real tree road trips. Bill Jordan in this industry and the fans, I'll give more credit, no different than a country singer, took me and placed me and, and gave me an opportunity and opened doors for me to do what I'm doing. And again, it's a cool American story of American dream. I don't have a college education. I won a world championship, a grand national championship in turkey calling. And I was blessed to really have a passion to bow hunt and I got pretty good at it. And I, and, and I told you the story of me being arrogantly thinking I could shoot anything and I missed it there at six yards. So since then I've tried to work on my craft and be better hunter and to just, just love, and I love it. Well, here's what makes me mad. So now I'm in a place, finally I own a, a, a farm in Georgia that I got big deer and big turkey. So for deer or turkey, you, you can bait for deer, but for turkey, you can't. You can put it out 10 days before the season or, or it has to be gone 10 days before you hunt. Here's what makes no sense, whether it's Michigan, whether it's anywhere you can't bait. Same here. Now, I can't bait turkeys, but I'm going to tell you what I did this year. I've got a John Deere tractor out here that I paid $75,000 for. The hair cost $2,000. I got my dad that works full-time for Bone Collector. That's my best friend who works with me every day, 40 hours a week. He works on my farm. And I'm, I'm not saying this to brag, but... What I am saying, $100 a bag, I bought Chupa. I've got freaking 200 to $300 a plot in fertilizer. And I've got Chupa. I've got four acres of Chupa that turkeys will eat it like a crackhead and down, like a crackhead <laughs> sniffing up cocaine. They will eat it and walk through a corn pile to eat this Chupa seed. I could have y'all, I could sit on it, my kids, I could have anybody legally sit on this Chupa field and shoot a turkey over planted bait because I can financially afford that tractor and help and fertilizer and I can make it grow. There's nothing native about it. That stuff yeah. is never grown in Georgia. It's a nut grass that's really an invasive weed that turkeys eat the bulbs off of their nuts. So you telling me that you have a kid who's never hunted, that maybe her dad got shot in Afghanistan, there's a single mother that's raising her that is starting to lose her because she's depressed she's frustrated or maybe it's a boy and they know you Dave they know one of these guys here on this podcast and you're like I'll take her hunting and it's a cold Michigan morning and you don't have a nice green field to sit her on you got a pine thicket up there and one of those draws and bridges that you can put a 50 pound pack of bag of corn out and and for any no expense at all there's a chance she would see a deer now what macho man out there is going to knock that to potentially not just get somebody into hunting we're talking about saving lives. We're talking about getting people off drugs. We're talking about changing a guy who is an alcoholic, this, this freaking running around like a crazy redneck around Detroit doing stupid stuff, getting with the wrong crowd. I would rather give him a hand-me-down Hoyt and a $100 budget to go buy some corn to stack up somewhere out there in Detroit 
and see how high he gets on hunting a deer. But now, no, this is what the state tells him. Well, yeah. unless you can freaking have an $80,000 tractor and you can figure out how to clear a couple acres, because if you hunt in Michigan, you're lucky to have 30, 40 and acres. And on the land. Hunt. Yeah, so you go clear cut it. Go clear cut you an area and, and de-stump it and plant you a green field. Oh, you know, guys, they'll come. Y'all got green fields. They'll be out there. But who in the hell in starting hunting can go buy tractors to farm to plant for deer? It yeah. makes me so mad. It makes no sense. It's so hypocritical. And it, 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 to me, it's systematic it's all in the, discrimination. All in the name of science. It's all in the uh, name it's, of it, science. Yeah, and then, and then don't, don't even get me started. Yeah, and, and, and the <laughs> CWD. Oh, and they, oh I, like I said, I, I'm, I think I could be Ted Nugent's younger son that he didn't know he had. Oh, I asked him what he was doing yeah. in 1973. But I get, I get so mad because, and then then all of a sudden the hunt community, like we'll we'll. We'll oh, shoot yeah. deer. Well, it must be nice, farm-raised, pen-raised corn piles. I'm like, yeah. my God, man, just I, uh, why is everybody in this freaking macho man syndrome? I don't get it. Last spring, I got to go to Texas uh, and hunt. Uh, um, Faradine invited me out there on a media hunt, so it was really exciting. I was like, wow, I've never done one. I was like, this is really cool. So I go out there. There's all these, you know, people there from the industry, like high-up people and, you know, all these other writers and podcasters and things. It was really exciting, you know, and, and I got to meet some really great people uh, at Lazy Sea Key Ranch is where it was in Texas. It yeah. was really wonderful. And uh, anyway, I had never hunted like a Texas hog before. And uh, I was going to tell you the story I forgot. So I just, I don't know why it clicked in my head. You were talking about baiting because they allow all that stuff there. You're like, you do all what they want. Anyway, um, so I hear, <laughs> I hear this like loud, like roar. And it's like, Rah! yeah. Rah! I'm like, what the hell is that? And all of a sudden, I just hear like all these like feet moving, and it just sounds like a stampede, you know, just things are running and grass and branches are breaking. And I see these black silhouettes just like going through. I was like early morning, you know, going throughout this landscape. I'm like, what the hell is happening? And I was at the time I was hunting an access buck, and he had come in to the uh, corn and the hogs were on the corn. I could see them, but I knew they were hogs. I could just tell, but it was dark and I could see this, yeah. I could see this, um, sick of buck and I could see that he had these horns. I saw him put his horns on, like charge the, the hogs. I'm like, this is amazing. So it starts getting lighter and lighter. And I'm like, Oh, I, you know, I didn't know how big he was. I'm like, Oh my God, that's a shooter. You know? So I shoot him. It was awesome experience. And then later they say, Hey, let's go back in that stand and you can, um, you know, hunt the hogs again. So I go back and again, they just come in like crazy. So I shoot one, they fly off, the guide comes over and I get down and he's like, and all of a sudden they come back and he's like, get back in the tree. <laughs> he's That's like, get awesome. back in the tree. So I run back in the tree and they're like going nuts. And he's like, got a handgun out and stuff. It was really exciting. It was scary too, for a little bit. Cause I had never experienced like a never wild, wild that. hog. I mean, it was, and I was gonna ask you if you've ever seen this before. I was sitting in the stand and I heard this, what sounded like a drone at first. I'm like, that's really weird. I go, maybe they're filming this, you know, cause I don't know. It's like a media hunt and it's getting louder. <clears throat> and I, and I'm, I'm about 30 feet up and uh, it's like a, is it a cedar tree? Is that what they have cedar trees? Yeah, probably cedar tree. Uh, or mesquite, mes yeah. mesquite or something. I'm sitting in it and it's not high up, like, you know, whatever, 12 yeah. feet. And I hear this thing and I look over my shoulder and I, I look and I see a huge cluster uh, look like a school bus of killer bees go by. oh yeah yeah and, it, and like it didn't at first it didn't scare me but i'm sitting there and all of a sudden i just like that was like really scary like that could have like came right on top of me and i i mean i mean it was like a school bus and they were just like a fist <laughs> i'm like what? Dude, have you ever you ever seen something like that I have seen only only time I've ever seen that swarm of bees. I mean, there's you know we got a bunch of honeybees and stuff around here, and you'll see, you know, swarms of those bees. But in Texas, man, I don't know what it is. Everything there will stick you, bite you. Um, it, it's like being in Africa in America. I mean, you're right. You can bait, and it's just a target-rich environment. There's not many places you can get in a blind in America, and literally shoot a hog, a deer, an oh, axis. Yeah. I shot four animals. And, and like, yeah, and a lot of these <laughs> places, I mean, a lot of these places, they do have a lot of high fences in Texas, but a lot mm -hmm. of free roaming places like, like the ranch you was on. And it's, it's yeah. insane. It's such, it's so fun. But that's what happens is when you leave Texas, you think, now Texas is doing it right. They're celebrating oh, it was great. 
the game board, and the only thing you don't do, you don't trespass and you don't poach because they won't put you in jail. They'll just kill you. Straight yeah, I'll up say, I, wouldn't, you. I wouldn't mess around and, there with those guys. And I'll tell you, though, Dave, what you're talking about, I'm telling you right now, these Democrat, liberal, left-wing oh, yeah. governors and mayors, they're, they're going after so much of what we love. You yeah. can look at this, this COVID situation. The first thing they did was shot, shut down the forest, shut down the non-resident hunting. They tried to shoot, shut down the resident hunting. Now, you think about it, you can't go buy chicken breast and toilet paper at the store. So now let's just shut hunting yeah. season down. My God, the, the, the best place to quarantine is out in the middle of nowhere trying to get you a mess of squirrels or maybe a turkey True to that. feed yourself. And so people can say what they want to about politics. I don't like politics, but we better get engaged. And if anybody's it's, listening, go to go to huntthevote.org. Org, and, and we come to find out, think about it, we got 13, 12, 13 million of us licensed hunters across the country. We can change an election. And let me tell you right now, um, even the Trump administration is doing some things that has never been done. They just opened up, a lot of people don't know this, just opened up 5.1 million acres of public land for all of us to hunt. They just signed a bill that put millions and millions of dollars back into opening, not just in conservation, opportunities for us to hunt. They just took the wolf off the endangered species list. And so if you look at this, if we get the right politics, they're going to come in to the states like Michigan and they're going to say, hey, hey, quit this nonsense. We're going to do it this way. We're going to celebrate it. And if there's a game warden listening to this podcast or watch our show, it's a game warden's job is no different than my job or your job. Our jobs are to celebrate hunting. So, yes, if somebody illegally does something, bust them, get them, yeah. find them. But you should celebrate. And we have got to make hunting easy and fun. And if we don't, we're going to lose it because yeah. these kids have everything in the world to play with. They have all the electronics. Hunting is not easy. It's not fun. You go up to Michigan, it's cold in the wintertime. Oh, Let's make sure I can, and, and you go take a kid out there or, or our wives, our, you know, some of your wives might hunt. Take our wives out there to Michigan, <laughs> set them in a stand for three days in about December, and they freeze their butt off out in the ladder stand. They're going to say, honey, that's good. I'm going to sit here and re watch reruns of Bachelorette. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just going <laughs> to drink my wine. If you love it, good for you. And so it's important that our kids understand what it's about and that they have freaking fun with it. I mean, we don't start. And, and then all the macho men, think about it. Man, let people hunt at the level they want to. The only reason freaking Chipper Jones ever played Major League Baseball, he started at T-ball, hitting off a tee. So let kids, let women, and let men too, if they're older, let them hunt and shoot what they want with what they want. Let them enjoy it. And let's quit trying to – flex and take the insecurity out of this thing and the egos and, and just get back to having fun. That's all we got to do. Hunt at the level you want to and shoot what you want to with what you want to. And I'm telling you, if we could just celebrate that for a full year, there's no telling how many licenses we would sell. There's no telling what our ratings would go up. And uh, I don't know. I mean, like what, what, what would I, what do I got to prove? What do you guys have to prove other than, Hey y'all, try hunting and fishing and i promise you'll like it and they will if we do it and especially but and i'll leave it at this too because i know we got to go in a minute but the number one compliment that we get at bone clicker and this makes me more proud than anything they will say what well, i won't go to hunting camp with y'all y'all look like y'all be fun to hang with that right there makes me feel so amazingly good accomplished because yes it, it they they never say dang Every once in a blue moon, even in Michigan, I said, dang, whatever, boy, you a turkey man. I mean, you know, because I love turkey hunting and I figured out all kind of little tricks to kill them. But 98% of the people that come by that shake my hand, like, Wally, I'd love going to hunt with you. Anything. I just want to be, <laughs> I bet you and Nick and T-Bone would be fun to hang out with. I'd love to go hunt with y'all. They And for me, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, that they saw this, that they yeah. saw that we just genuinely – have fun and along the way we might do some cool stuff and get some big animals but the fun is what's contagious and i think if it, and you can be the tough guy you can be the guy who is a trophy hunter but you still got to figure out a way to twist it into some fun and and i think that's all that this industry is missing is just some self-confidence yeah eliminate the male ego which we all have it me and i, I have it y'all have it we all have it but control it, realize it exists, and try to make it fun. And and if we do that, I, I just think that people will see hunting in a whole different light, and they will realize how much fun it is. 
And when they have fun, that's when you're going to start getting serious. That's when you're not going to be afraid to sit all day out in the Michigan cold after one particular buck. Then all of a sudden what sucks becomes fun out of our desire. But it started with just a hunting camp, eating good chili. It started with the guy that is in hunting camp that you're just laughing. You just want to go to hunting camp and hunt because cousin Eddie's going to be there and you're going to be in stitches the whole time. Uh, I mean, it, there's so many reasons. So uh, I can't say that enough. And that, that's, that's my hot topic right now. I just want people to realize the joy, the joy of the culture that we represent. And uh, I, I can't get that over enough. Awesome. All right, Michael Idell, Bone Collector. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, you doing this and uh, we'll be in touch. I definitely want to get you guys on. Maybe we can get the whole team out one time for a live session. That would be really fun. Um, I would love to ask do questions it, and you know you guys can maybe we could do, do your dual thing. hunt camps do, what was that I could, dual hunt camps dual hunt camps you, you dang <laughs> right man that would be fun that would be a fun live y'all in y'all's camp we had wherever wi-fi and we're in ours and out by the fire and uh they're you guys gonna would tell die. them what that come off oh god i would camp. love it everybody's blurred their speech <laughs> Yeah, you, you have, a, ha, have some true Michiganders talking with y'all's northern accent and us and our southern, and especially we get a couple of beers and it's nobody know what in the hell we said, not even <laughs> us to each other. So I'll have to pull on my so, southern draw. Bad. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's where, maybe if we do this, we go to a Georgia camp, a Michigan camp, and then the Euper camp, all at the oh, same time. He's got it. Kevin's got the Euper camp and Jamie. Wow, they both do now I think about it. All right, Mike, <laughs> thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank y'all. And I was going to tell y'all this, man. Thank y'all yeah, for what y'all do, buddy. I know y'all got day jobs and um, I'm a fan of what y'all do. And this industry ain't alive without everybody working toward that American hunting dream. And so I respect what you guys do. And, and I'm humbled to be on the, on the show, man. So anytime y'all need us and apologize too, Dave, I know I was wide open, but I'm glad I'm finally on. You got my number. I'd love no to come problem. back on anytime and we'll get, we'll get T-Bone. T-Bone's easier to me. All you got to do is get him in front of a bag of Cheetos and an ice cold Coca-Cola and you, he, he'll talk all day. So uh, thank y'all. Y'all keep on much success to you guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you, Mike. Take care. See Thanks. You, Thanks so much for listening to the Bow Hunter Planet podcast online at bowhunterplanet.com with your host, Team BHP. Check us out on Facebook at Bow Hunter Planet. We'll catch you next time.